And next, we are going to be talking about the classroom. Um, a really big topic right now for so many of us, uh, especially those of us who have children, um, and what it's going to look like. So this is back in the classroom, safely reopening RI schools. For many of us, the biggest question of the summer is what will schools like, look like in the fall? And now that uh, Rhode Island School Districts have submitted their plans to ride, an idea of what the future, class, future of classrooms will look like statewide is beginning to take shape we will be t discussing the impact and also opportunities um, in this new state of reopening schools in September. So Dana, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi everyone. Um, I know it's about lunchtime, but it's so good to see you all. And this is my first Venture Cafe. So I'm pretty excited to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Dana Borelli Murray. I am the executive director of the Highlander Institute. Uh, we're a nonprofit here in Providence, Rhode Island, um, working with schools around the country, um, really thinking about stakeholders um, as agents of change in the education system to design and redesign classrooms that empower, schools that adapt, and systems that liberate. So uh, COVID hit, and uh, those things became you know, even more front and center. So just a little framing for today, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, you know, I just want to acknowledge right off the top that like this topic uh, in conversation right now is starting to turn highly politicized um, and uh, it's being very linked to identity politics. Uh, I just want to acknowledge also that there's tremendous uncertainty in where, so like there's a treading lightly of knowing that a lot of these, we don't know what the actual plan is going to, going to end up being. Um, and it seems to be right now, it's a huge game of chess in terms of which scenario ends up playing out. Um, multiple choose your advent own adventure steps right now. Um, and so I think for the panelists, I just wanna say that I wanna acknowledge all of this and that this is not like a gotcha kind of situation, but really just a time for us to pull up the hood and try to have a good open conversation about how we're all coming into this from our different directions. Um, I know that for me, on March 10th, I was at the State House with hundreds of students and educators learning about who was winning the big Rhode Island XQ High School Awards. And the next week, I canceled my three-day thousand-person conference for the, at the Rhode Island Convention Center. That is how fast this all took place. We were at a gathering of hundreds of youth and then a week later, canceling one of our biggest, um, for my organization, our biggest event for the year. Um, so I know we've all been on this uh, wild roller coaster together. For framing for people that aren't on that aren't in the education space, and if you have missed the newspaper, every district in Rhode Island had to submit multiple plans. They were due on July 17th to the Department of Education. Um, these would cover what what if scenarios of what if we go back full time, what if it is all distance learning, and what if it is some form of a hybrid. And the timeline, which again, I'm not holding, I'm giving a lot of grace, but the timeline to this is that um, Riot is reviewing these and that they're gonna be turned back on the 28th and that final plans will be announced on the 31st of July. And that sometime during the first or second week of August, there will be determining around like what scenarios are the most appropriate. Again, these are like the most up-to-date kind of, I don't even know if that timeline has changed as of today. So. Um, but that's where we're kind of coming into this conversation from. So um, with no further ado, I would really love to just start by turning to the panelists and having each panelist introduce themselves, their name, their role, their angle into education, and just asking a question of, in your world right now, like what's on top for you? Uh, my name is Deborah Adekunle, and I'm an upcoming senior at Classical High School. And I'm also a student intern with PVD Young Makers and Youth in Action. And on top of my word right now is my HackCAD initiative, which is demonstrating a type of real life learning because I believe that the current school system is failing out to many of our students. Um, I can pass it on to Christine. Thanks, Deborah. Hi, I'm Christine Lapierre. Um, I wear a few different hats uh, when we talk about uh, education. Uh, I am a teacher. Um, I've been teaching for, uh, this will be my 14th year in the classroom. I currently teach English language arts at Hope High School in Providence. 
Um, I'm a senior policy fellow uh, with Teach Plus Rhode Island, um, but I'm also an elected member of the school committee uh, in Jamestown, which is where I live with my husband and my daughter, who is a rising fifth grader. So I'm a professional educator. I'm also a parent. Um, so I straddle uh, the fence on a lot of these different conversations um, about, you know, what I want for my students, what I want for my daughter, and then what I need for myself professionally. So I'm super excited to be here, and um, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Jennifer. Oh, sorry, I didn't say what was top on my mind, and that is definitely safety at this point. So, sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Jen Lima. Uh, I am not a professional educator. I actually have no formal training in that area whatsoever. But what I do have is 30 years of personal experience navigating various public and private schools as being a mom. Um, so I'm here as a parent and also as a candidate for the North Kingstown School Committee um, for the town of North Kingstown. Um, my primary concern, aside from the obvious health and safety, like Kristen said, is um, educational equity. Um, this upcoming year is going to be like nothing we ever seen and I think that the switch to distance learning has only heightened educational disparities um, so I think we just need to ensure that those kids who are most likely to fall between um, who fall behind don't fall through the cracks and I would like to pass it along to Rob good morning everyone I'm uh, Robert Young I'm the director of the Newport area career and technical center uh, we're a regional career and technical center located in Newport Rhode Island uh, grades 9 through 12 uh, we have various um, programs over here. We have students from everywhere from North Kingstown to Jamestown, Newport, Portsmouth, Middletown, uh, Tiverton, um, and Little Compton. So uh, one of our, I guess, most innovative programs is our PTEC program, where students are enrolled in high school and uh, uh, Community College of Rhode Island and where they can work on their uh, degree in cybersecurity. Uh, happy to say that this year we had one student, the first of the state, to finish um, his high school diploma and his associate degree all in four years. And we're on track to have, we have two more that should do it um, in December. They just have to go one more semester at, at the community college. But we're on track for, for many more students to graduate and uh, get jobs in the um, cybersecurity industry, which uh, is, uh, you know, high growth, high demand, high wage uh, um, job opportunity for them. So our PTEC is one of our uh, most innovative programs. And right now for me, what's on my mind is just making sure you know, one, that the building is ready for students, you know, in August, but also, you know, how do we keep the students engaged uh, if we do have to go virtual because we are working with both high school students and, you know, college students. So having a student, a high school age student go to college is difficult in itself, but to, to add the virtual portion of that um, is even more difficult. So those are things that, uh, you know, are, are top of my mind. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to back to me back to Dana all right thank you thanks Rob so and I see there's a bunch of people on the call and so it's good to see all of you um, I have some questions that I'm gonna lob to the group and then we're gonna hold some time at the end for some open conversation uh, in Q&A from the crowd so the first question I just want to throw to the panelists are when you think about school and education you think about fill in the blank and I'll turn it over to Rob first. You can start us. So when I think about school, you know, I think about, um, you know, many different things, but one is op many opportunities for students. You know, I think now, you know, students want to come to school and, and pursue many options, you know, many careers or many choices. Um, so that's kind of what we do over here at the, the Career and Tech Center. Um, you know, how can we provide opportunities for them, to whether they want to go to college or whether they want to go out right into, into you know, get a, a career. Uh, so I think we have to provide, um, you know, our students the opportunity to get those skills to go out either into the workplace or, um, you know, or into college. Christine, you want to jump in? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, when I think about school, uh, I think about people. Uh, school is one of those words that we use uh, to, it has multiple meanings. And for me, it's so much more than just the building. Um, as an educator, if I don't have a relationship with a student, 
um, there's not a lot that I can do. Um, if I don't have a relationship with my colleagues or my administrators, then I don't have access to those relationships that I need to become a better teacher and to push myself. Um, so I think about the people. And during this conversation, I think that the people are really a driving force. And there are so many voices uh, that need to be heard uh, in this conversation about, you know, what school's going to look like. So I think people. Um, for me, when I hear the school, school, when I hear the word school, I think about a community designed to cultivate every kid's passion. I think about a system that, um, that a system by the students for the students, a system that has been designed for kids by kids. And unfortunately, that's not what our school looks like. And I hope like with conversation like this, we can get it to where it needs to be. Oops. That's great, Deborah. Um, I think it's a great question because I think how you feel about school can really shape your attitude and your outlook about learning in general. Like if you cringe when you think about school, that's not good. Um, like adults joke all the time about how they spend more time at work than they do with their family. And that's great, but they're getting paid to do that. And sometimes they're lucky enough to have a job that they're passionate about. Um, school should be a place that kids look forward to going to and that provides them with real life skills to be successful in the future. So I think it's just creating a positive attitude about school in general. Yeah, I really love that. Thank you guys all for indulging me in that fill in the blank question. Um, so I heard options, I heard people, opportunities, cultivating passions. Thank you, Deborah. I could have, couldn't have said that better at all. Um, and then these positive attitudes and relationships that we build through when we think of school itself. Um, and you know, for a long time, schools have been trying to think about school, the actual, like the building, the facility, the stuff of school in a very different way. Um, you know, we've all heard the, the adage of like, schools have looked the same for 150 years and how do we change them? We're in a post-industrial economy. Like we've heard the whole spiel and um, it has continued to feel a bit like pushing a, a boulder up a hill to really get momentum around um, shifting the ways that we think about what education and what, what a school itself, it, its role within this could play. And then, and then COVID hit and then every single kid in America had to suddenly learn in a very different way and educators had to teach in a very different way. And it was no longer just relegated to those innovators or those early adopters, but instead something that we all had to collectively embrace um, during what, Christine, you said it so perfectly around like, um, you know, an emergency or, you know, um, spring, it wasn't distance learning, it was emergency learning, which felt like, but there were things that came out of that as well. So, um, so thanks for that. Uh, the question I just wanted to say, and anyone on the panel can jump in is, so as I mentioned, these, these uh, different, you know, we had to emergency figure things out for the spring, but now we've had to emergency build multiple plans and scenarios that we have no idea which one we will be taking the lead. Um, but from your perspective and from the school or the community that you're coming from, um, this exercise we know of futility of, of building all these plans was incredibly hard and taxing on the people involved in, in trying to do that. From your perspective, how were these plans made and who had a voice in making these plans? So in Newport, um, you know, each, each building has their own team that puts the plan together. So we have an elementary school, a middle and a high school. So they work together on their particular plan because the needs are different. Um, so I can speak mainly at the high school. So we do have meetings where parents are involved, obviously teachers are involved, uh, the district representatives are involved, um, our facilities, you know, maintenance team, they're the ones who are gonna have to you know, do the cleaning, they're involved. Uh, so, so it's really all inclusive are, are involved in the plan. Um, you know, we sent out surveys to the parents, uh, asked for their feedback. You know, we have uh, the principal of Rogers High School has uh, meetings over uh, Google Hangout or Zoom, uh, you know, to get parent input. Um, so, it, it, and then we also have to get, you know, certain um, guidelines from Department of Education and Department of Health as well. So. Uh, you know, we, we try to include as many people as we can, um, you know, to get as much input as we can in making these plans. 
Um, I'll, I'll jump in and say uh, right over on the other side of the bridge from Newport, um, I wasn't involved in uh, the Providence plan, but I was very involved in the Jamestown plan. And I know that the superintendent um, sent out a survey form to all parents, constituents, community members whose emails were in the bank um, that received news from him um, and basically just calling people to come and to be involved. And from there, uh, it was whittled down to a team of 50 people and he tried to get a cross section of uh, parents, um, facilities, janitorial, um, community members. We had a, a person who was on the committee who is just lives in town here and is a doctor. Um, it's a, a very unique, uh, you know, position compared to where I work because there are about a thousand students total in Jamestown. We only go K through eight. Um, so some of the pieces, uh, as Rob mentioned, in terms of like what the high school needs being very different, um, we're pretty fortunate here that um, we're looking at a pretty similar age group. I know some districts have K through eight schools. Um, we go K through four and then five through eight. Um, so the needs of those students developmentally have a tendency to align a little bit easier, um, but there were still a bunch of voices that were involved in crafting those plans. And then the superintendent did three different uh, presentations uh, via Zoom to um, parents, community members, people who could show up and hear what those ideas were. And I know that there were a lot of questions and comments that came out of that. Um, that caused those of us that were doing that work to go back to different aspects of the plan and look at them now with that new filter. So that's what happened here uh, in Jamestown. Um, I for one know that my voice or my family's voice, voices were not represented or presented, present in those meetings. And I can tell you that most of my friends, family also were not in those meetings. And the decision makers, for Providence School District, they have a very narrow perspective. They're all looking from the adult perspective to um, with these decisions. And students like me have a ton of possible plans that can be implemented for our school's return, but they don't, they're not listening to us. My hack at initiatives provides a solution for both distance and in-person learning. After school programming is are the like the future of education. If we look at after school programming, we can see that every kid in those model um, succeed. And after school programmers have done a good job trans um, transforming it to a virtual space during this COVID crisis. And um, no, sorry, this makes it that like after school um, programs is the only sensible move to use with um, distance or in-person learning. Um, this Hackett initiative is a student led or a student involved movement, which is the only right way to do it. Students are needed in this decision making tables, especially minority students, because their voices are always underrepresented and not heard, and they are the future of our generation. I have to echo um, what Deborah said that I, the, the feeling in North Kingstown is similar that there was not a lot of input prior to the plans being put through. There was a subcommittee, but it, it, it was selected by the administration. There wasn't like in Jamestown where the call went out, who wants to be on it? And I, I know that they worked really hard on putting the plans together. It's a large school district. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. You know, nobody's disputing that they had, you know, the best efforts involved. But I think uh, based on the Zoom meeting that they had the other night, there's a lot of frustration from parents and students because we have a very strong active student government as well. And they didn't really feel like there was a voice before the plan was presented. And I think that kind of goes a long way to getting buy-in. Um, even if you don't ultimately like what is agreed upon, I think if people feel like they were part of the, you know, solution, it helps people, you know, just feel better about the whole thing. So um, I, I do think that that is something that could be improved upon for the, any tweaks that have to be made to the plans moving forward. Thank you all. And Deborah, I just want to echo and thank you for your honesty and uh, courage to speak as a student through this a panel with a bunch of adults sitting here listening. So it, your voice to power right now is so, so, so relevant. So thank you so much. 
Um, and when we get to your question a little later on, Deborah, I would love if you wanted to speak a little bit more about HackEd to people to, to explain more about the project, because some people might not be familiar with, your, with the initiative. Um, Christine, I'm going to throw it back over to you. I wanted to just say that, that school is a lot of things, and we mentioned that at the top of this time together, but at the heart really are the teachers. And just thank you so much for your work every day. It's, tire it's tireless. It's amazing. Um, you know, but this move to uh, distance learning in the spring was nothing short of monumental in terms of the work that educators were able to pull off in such a short amount of time. It's really incredible. Um, I would love to know if you could share with people that maybe don't have children in the system or haven't lived through this, like what was the defining moment or example for you from your mind from this past spring? Sure. Um, basically, we had a week. <laughs> um, within that week, we were, you know, on spring break, um, but I don't know one teacher that had any rest or relaxation during that week uh, because we basically had a week to pivot, uh, to, to plan, to prep. Um, some people built classrooms in their living rooms, <laughs> some people in their dining rooms. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the pictures of like the science and math teachers in their showers using their um, uh, what is it? Their their tile as a, a right and white board as they you know wrote out equations. Um, the speed at which people had to adapt was phenomenal. Um, and speaking personally, I know I felt so much more connected to my community of educators at Hope High School because we were all leaning on each other as we learned what different people's strengths were. Um, Yes, there were a lot of um, products and tech companies that offered us access to their products uh, for free or for reduced prices. I learned a ton from, you know, just the people that I work with who were like, oh, I tried this program and here's what I found really useful about it. So it opened up a dialogue organically to have professional learning communities. And I think that the constraints of that belt bell school schedule that we all have so often teachers have a tendency to work in silos and to really only focus on what happens in the four walls of their classroom. So literally knocking down those walls created a, a greater opportunity um, for teachers to really, um, you know, sharpen their craft and work with one another to do that collectively. Um, what stands out to me at this moment in time is, as you alluded to earlier, Dana, we are at a crossroads right now. For years, people have been saying that the education model as it exists now is antiquated and we need to make changes. And there have been a handful of innovative voices, but COVID-19 and that immediate you know, flipping a light switch to distance learning forced everyone kind of into the deep end of the pool. And, you know, some people were a lot more comfortable swimming there and up for other people, it was terrifying. Um, but the SWOT analysis of what we've done and what we've learned can really now impact conversations about what schools look like moving forward. Because when we, when we look at what was happening even, you know, March 10th, we are never going to be able to go back to that. So, you know, how do we take what we've learned and grow and adapt moving forward? And I just think that that is an exciting time for teachers. Uh, it's an exciting conversation to be able to, to have because we get to lend voice to something that could impact education for the next 50 to 100 years. So I'm personally excited to be an educator right now. Um, admittedly, I was terrified <laughs> in March, um, but I'm really excited moving forward at the prospect of the long lasting ch systemic changes that can be made. Yes, very much. Thank you so much. Um, Jennifer, I want to turn it to you um, as our, you know, resident parent expert on the panel today. Uh, you know, I think what we, and this really plays right into what Christine was just saying about like, it is, if we can try to find the silver lining somewhere, like, you know, this is an exciting moment. 
in the world of being a parent, I have four little kids under seven in my house. It's crazy around here. Totally bananas. Um, I, and I work in education every day. Um, and, but for the most part, I'll admit that up to this point, it's kind of been like the cobbler's kid has no shoes in my house where it's like, I just sort of think that my, like everything's fine with them because I'm trying to handle it like in my work every day. Um, the world of what happened in the spring and what we're heading into has offered parents such an unprecedented, never before behind the scenes view into the education system that has never been experienced at this level. Parents suddenly are having actual thoughtful conversations about content, delivery, approach, assessment. Like it's like conversation, people talk about stuff now and are seeing stuff. They see how their teachers interact. They see how their students interact. They see the work, they see the scope, they see the cadence. Um, so Christine, I wanted to just, you know, uh, sorry, Jennifer, I wanted to just push that over to you and just get some more of your thoughts on um, how this role, how if in your 30 past your years and your experience looking into the system as a parent, how has this felt different for you and how has this perhaps propelled your interest in being more involved at the school committee level? Well, first off, I was joking with my friends who are teachers that this is the year to put whatever it is that you want on your request list because you're going to get it. <laughs> I mean, if there was ever a year when teachers were appreciated, I mean, this is it, my God. Um, so my kids are 30, 18. I had a class of 2020 grad, and then I have a 16-year-old and a 15-year-old. So luckily, you know, I wasn't dealing with littles because that would have been very, very challenging. Um, but I really think that this has been, in some ways, distance learning is tough, like for everybody, parents, teachers, kids. I think some children thrive with it. Like for my kids, it was great in some aspects because older kids, you can kind of set your own schedule. You can do what you want. You can wake up, you can get everything done. Younger kids who need a little bit more structure, I think, um, you know, it was a little bit more challenging in the beginning, but like Christine said, that was emergency learning. I think true distance learning is going to come out of this. And I think there's an opportunity to be more not traditional, like ABCs, one, two, threes, you know, um, lesson plans. I think there's a lot more opportunity for creative real life lesson experiences with switching to this. Um, and I, I think more of a collaborative effort between teachers and students. Um, so it, it's definitely, I, I honestly, I think it, it's a different mindset for me because my kids are older than they would be if they were, were younger. But I think as different as it is, I think it's a good, a lot of things with the old system were not working um, in terms of learning. I, I think the one thing that, you know, we need to look for in, in switching is like I said to my kids all the time, like, you know, we're fortunate. We have internet. We have, you know, a safe space at home, you know, things like that. Not every kid has that. And I think that's one area that as there is more of a switch, we have to make sure that those kids are taken care of within the, you know, the distance learning shift. Um, because, you know, that's something that a traditional school environment would provide those kids that maybe the, you know, non, the distance learning scenario doesn't. Does that answer what you're looking for? Yep, right on the right track. And also just thinking about, I think not only the us seeing into the system, but the role that parents as, and students, as Deb was speaking earlier, like the collaborative effort that we can now bring to the table and offer our voice within change, changes to the system that we need to want to see. Absolutely. Yep. Um, Rob, you know, I've admired you as an educator for many, many years and think your work is incredible. And you know, um, you know, the work that you're doing in Newport is really cutting edge and kind of beyond what a lot of people understand that education could be. So when we talk about where education should go, there's, you should be looking, people should be looking at P-TECH programs and looking at other things that have been ahead of their time. Um, Tell us from the role of a school and systems administrator, um, you know, if school is back in buildings in the fall, just can you paint a picture of how this experience will be different for students um, pri than prior to COVID and like how will it feel different and um, in the good and the bad, you know, what are, what are you starting to anticipate? Sure, so, you know, I think, you know, in the bad, um, you know, I think a lot of us envision, you know, our students walking to school with masks on and 
you know, washing your hands every 15 minutes, um, not having that social gathering group um, that we that they normally do in high school. And I think if you ask just about every student, what do you miss most? It's, you know, I miss my friends. I miss seeing them. So I think, you know, when you talk about the bad, I think that's potentially, um, you know, w what can happen, uh, you know, because we ha definitely we have to have the smaller class sizes, fewer kids on the bus. And I think we're, we're kind of all aware of, of that kind of stuff. But, you know, we, Christine um, touched on this and we kind of talked about it a little bit yesterday in our pre-meeting is that this is going to force us to do things differently, not just here in Rhode Island, but, you know, but nationwide. And so we have had some, some panels of students, you know, design your own school. What would school look like if you could build it? And I think this is going to force us to, to, to hear that, you know, hear what those students have said and say, all right, you know, how can we do that? So, you know, one of those things is, you know, if, if we're going to do things virtually or if things are going to be smaller, then, then students may have more opportunities to take different classes because now we're not locked into that 7 a.m. to 2.15 block. So you may take a class with a teacher at 5 o'clock at night because that teacher, maybe they have to put their, you know, work with their kids in the morning. So now, now their schedule is going to be different. This is like my, you know, somebody asked me one time in an interview, like, what's your dream school? And I said, right now we're almost building that. So like a school without walls. So students are going to have the opportunity and, you know, yeah, it might be in small groups, but instead of coming here, you know, I see Steve Heath on there. Maybe they're going to go to Fab Newport and do some work over there with him. Or maybe they're going to go, you know, down to the, to the ocean instead of studying biology in the classroom. All right, we're going to take this team today. We're going to meet, we're going to study. Our biology class is going to be held somewhere here. So it's really, I would see it's going to force us to look at things differently, uh, use, you know, other buildings. Like we, you know, because we're in P-TECH, we have CCRI, you know, in Newport, which is only, you know, five miles away from me, we, we, we can utilize their labs or their computer systems which brings into the equity piece. So now students don't have laptops or computers. So, you know, we can share resources with them. Um, but, but, and I think, you know, now career choices are going to start to change. We're seeing, okay, what, you know, what can people do? If you go to certain places, we took our students to a tour um, to a facility and, and up on the third floor, uh, Gilbane Construction. He showed us, you know, kind of a, a wing of their place and it was empty. And he's like, why is it empty? Because now we can do all this stuff virtually. We can show you a building that we're building without you having to go to that building. Like we can, we're building a hospital. We can virtually show that. So now you don't have to come into the building to do that. You can reach out. So I do think this experience is going to change kind of the one, the way the, the students, you know, expect to, to be educated, but also the fact that, you know, now we know that we can do things differently and now we have those opportunities to do that. So it's going to force us to, to, to kind of change. So I see like, you know, high school students being able to have, uh, choices of when they take classes, what classes they take, and, and sometimes even how they take those classes. So uh, I, I just look at this as a, as a really an opportunity for us to, to, to change how we're going to, you know, educate the future uh, of, you know, of our students. I thank you. I love that. And I really think that idea of shifting expectations and that these possibilities, it's opened a lot of doors to possibilities in a way that before might have been seen as a little like, you know, left of center, alternative, not mainstreamed enough. But now it's like we've all had to be forced into an innovation space in our really, and we can do this in a positive way. Uh, Deb, I want that to kind of shift into my questions for you because, you know, to me, equity is front and center to my thoughts every day about education. And um, how do we make sure that we're centering those decision making processes around equity and really making sure that we are pulling on what Rob and others have said around like these co this collaborative energy that we're feeling. Um, I want to make sure is this something that is happening at the or can happen at the student level. Um, and how do we do that the right way. And please tell us more about um, your work with hack ed too. Um, I think that um, Rob's design school or um, future classroom is already in works for Hackett. That's exactly what we're looking for. That's what, exactly what we're working for. We are um, a co-generational alliance to revamp the school structure. We have seen that the school structure that we have right now and the school system that we have right now is failing a lot of students. It's not working. That system was set up for the students 100 years ago and not for the students of 2020. And I feel like um, if we can follow the after-school model, like I said before, 
that we can change the face of education. After school model is the future of education. Every kid that has gone into an after school program has succeeded because they have cultivated their passion. They have filled their fire in those um, um, programs. And with, in do, uh, the way our schools are constructed now, distance learning or in person, it's, it's never, never been in favor for the low income or minority students because of the way it's set up. And many schools, in many schools, like I'm an immigrant and other immigrants like I, we are failing in this classroom because it wasn't for us, which is why I repeatedly like emphasize on ACAD. I would never have thought of being in this, this kind of setting. I would never have thought of being in this meeting like, us, like this. And I think that a lot of immigrant kids don't think that they will ever be in this kind of place because of the way that our system has been for them. Um, ACHEAD is, uh, sorry, um, ACHEAD is incorporating culturally inclusive and um, culturally relevant curriculum into our classroom. It's allowing every student success to be inevitable. It's, we're currently working with Fab New for United Way, Pivoting of Makers, Red Island Office of Innovation and Educate to um, set out a student survey. And that survey would um, gather our student inputs that would allow us to revamp the school structure in the classrooms. Because without the students' input, you cannot make a classroom that will allow students to succeed if you don't have students' voice on the table. It just doesn't make sense. So um, I feel like for our classrooms to be um, equitable, you need to put student of colors and students in decision making around the table so that we can um, get everyone's input and um, efficiently cater to every student's needs. And with HACED, we, me and other students that are with our HACED initiative, we are, um, every, like um, Jennifer, Jennifer said that it's a, it's a, like many students um, succeeded and many students didn't thrive because of the way our classrooms have been set up. And if we can make every student thrive, which is what ACHEAD was doing, that I guess that a lot of students will um, succeed. It's basically just following after school models. After school models are the future of education. After school models are the one that letting students succeed. Every, every, like I can use classical for an example because I attend classical. A lot of our classical students are, are not equipped for the, they want to be college ready, they want to be ready, they want to succeed, but they're not equipped with the necessary resources to succeed. And you can, if you ask them like, what is the, what their favorite part of school, they would mention all the after school programs they're doing outside of the school environment, because in those environments, they are succeeding there. In the classrooms, they are not succeeding because that hasn't been designed for them. Hey. Dana, can I, can I just piggyback on her just for so a couple of things hearing her talk? So for one, I think we've all heard that high school students can learn from home. They don't have to be in the building. Let's focus on K to five or K to eight. And what she's telling us is obviously that that's inaccurate, right? So there's one. So it's super important for your voice to be heard because the, the powers that be are making the decisions aren't making decisions uh, based on what, what you're saying. And just another piece of that. So um, we're here in Newport, we're able to kind of disaggregate our graduation rate data. And so the students that are in, in the career and tech program, and I'm not, I'm not taking, you know, credit for this. It's all because of the teachers. They had a 96% graduation rate for students that were in CTE. And that's all because they have, they choose to be in that particular program and they form those bonds with their teachers. And that's the highest subgroup in, in all of Newport. So when you're talking about you know, you would break it down by, you know, boy, girl, we break it down by race, you know, money, no money, free lunch, blah, blah, any of that. So that's the highest subgroup of, of, of anything was the 96% of the students. And really that's because they form those bonds with the teachers and that CTE piece is why they get out of bed every day and come to school. They know that they're going to go there and I'm cooking, um, you know, in culinary today, I'm going to go and build that bridge somewhere. Or I'm going to work on this IT program. So that motivates them and fires them up. So if you have school choice like that, it's going to have a major impact. And then, you know, she was talking about equity. You know, I think that this, if we don't get this right, the socioeconomic impact on this country is going to, is going to hit us in, in, you know, within the next 10 years, greater than anything ever has, because there are students at home 
who have parents that can sit down and go over their English or math with them. There are students whose parents are fathers and engineers. So obviously he can do the math with, with some of these students. Mothers, you know, maybe she's an English teacher or something. She can do that. And, and they're, you know, they're progressing at a higher rate than those who don't have those parents that are at home helping them. So I think the impact of this, if you don't get this right, right now, is going to devastate, um, you know, not only Rhode Island, but nationwide uh, with, with dealing with our, the, I think the gap between, you know, the haves and the have nots is growing in, even greater. And, you know, in some places, a lot of prison, um, uh, what they're planning for in, in their prison um, numbers is based on their second and third grade um, tests. So if they're gonna, if they're gonna kind of base it off of that, and our students in those grades that don't have access are gonna fall behind, that number is gonna grow exponentially. And I think we, you know, people really have to realize how important it is to, to, to close that gap to prevent that from happening. And I want to um, make two points, or several points that I want to um, continue on, because um, he, he said that um, our students would not go to an after-school program that doesn't cater to the need. A student would not go to somewhere after school, to somewhere that they don't feel comfortable in. And if our, the students, the um, underrepresented students, minority students, if they, they, they obviously go to after-school programs that are cater to the need, and if we can incorporate that to the classroom, and they will succeed. I know like math and English, they're all important, but also as we can, I learned sewing from my after school program. I can incorporate math and English to sewing and I can also use that in, it's a life skill that I can use afterwards. I use in sewing right now to help my community. I'm sewing masks for everybody in the community. Some kids don't feel as useful as that because they don't have that skill. They, they might have the skill, but there's nowhere to cultivate that skill. There's nowhere to build upon that skill. Many students just need a place where they can cater to their needs, which is every after school program. I feel like there is an after school program in Rhode Island for any student. And if we can just get that into the classrooms in online, after school, after school programs can be used online too. I'm literally to after school program online and I'm still succeeding as a student because of after school programs. School has been out for two months now and I am still succeeding as a student because of I'm in after school programs. It's after school programs that cultivate kids' passions and they should be put in our classrooms. The after school programs also close that um, have or have not gap because they, they, um, there's no like, oh, the, the minority kid doesn't have this um, resources and the other kid doesn't have that resource. Because an after school program, it's all, it's all equal. I really love that framing. Um, and so what I'm hearing from all of you when I've heard from all of your conversations is that there have been these, with, within this crazy world, we can try to, we can say that there have been these bright spots. And, you know, usually in like a data world, like if you do a scatter plot of something, the things that are on the, on the fringe usually cut that stuff off, you know, because that's considered, you know, an outlier. But I really think that if, we're, if we think about even just data in a different way and think about our outliers instead as potential bright spots and do a deeper analysis of how did some of these things go really, really well in such a moment of crisis, there's a lot of learning we can do across collaboratively across the whole system. So some of the bright spots I heard, Christine, you talking about like collaboration among teachers, organic collaboration in schools that maybe hadn't happened at that kind of level before. I heard around Rob, like thinking about things like C and programs where kids have choice and experiential learning. Um, Deb, I'm hearing from like the world of the after school space. I, I love that world passionately. So I, I understand that the role that that can play not only in um, providing, I think, relevant core learning for students that is standards aligned, but also like the deeper, more meaningful choice based demonstrating of mastery of learning. So I'm with you on all of those pieces. Um, I wanted to make sure um, that I heard, like, these were some bright spots I heard you all saying, and I really think that we as a collective, as a country or as a state, really should do a, like a major analysis of those bright spots as we think about the planning for the long term. What are the things we can really learn from that? So uh, before I move on to the next, or opening it up for questions from the crowd, um, are there other bright spots that people wanted to, like, bring to the table that they've, they've seen or experienced? 
I, I think one thing is a, a collective engagement from everybody to get more involved and pull more together that they see that there's a need for a change and areas for improvement. And I think now more than ever, I think people are mobilizing in whatever way. Some people are doing it one way, some people are doing it another, but I think everybody feels a pull or a call to do something. You know what I mean? And I think that definitely is a bright spot. I'm seeing more engagement from everybody, kids, parents, teachers, you know, which I think is, is something that hasn't happened before. Yeah, I think one of the things too um, that uh, has kind of been a small kernel in my mind, but uh, Deborah and Rob just kind of reminded me of it is that oftentimes in high school, the narrative is you must go to college. And I think that when shelter in place happened and only essential workers were reporting, we saw people who were truck drivers, who were supermarket managers. It really caused us, I think, as a society to stop and think about what are those careers that do keep our economy coming, you know, keep it moving. Um, I'm a first generation person in my family to go to college and I come from a long line of plumbers and truck drivers, and all of my uncles were able to purchase homes. And, you know, and I think that, it, it, Rob, you had kind of alluded to that widening of that gap. And I think that I'm hoping that this sets us up for a pendulum swing where we kind of um, say, you know what, there's a lot more room in that middle class to talk about how kids can live a happy life and not go hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt to try and go to college because we're seeing that student debt, um, you know, and student aid kind of become a big issue right now as well. And I think that when we see where these points kind of intersect, it allows us to have an opportunity to talk about okay, so what should education be preparing our students for? Because um, I feel like too long now the emphasis has been on preparing them for college as opposed to we're starting to hear more now college and career. And I'd really like to hear that career kind of get a little bit bigger um, and front and center in the conversation. I would like to like answer Christine's question. I think that our schools and our education should be preparing students for real life problems, not college. College is not the only way to leave. Um, with a bright spot that I see during this um, crisis is student engagement. Like our students have not been in classroom for a lot of months now. And I'm telling you, everyone is ready to learn something. Um, and if we, if we can move away from looking at a student from the test scores, because I feel like our, our government and our education system has always emphasized those test scores. And if we can look at this kid holistically, and I know that you guys are tired of hearing me say after school programs, which is what after school programs do, they look at the kids from a holistic view, which is, I feel like every kid has something. Most kids are not good at tests, but they're good at another thing, which is what with the kids, children engagement that we're, we're seeing as we're moving into this new phase of education, I feel like we should use that kid, children engagement to look at them from a holistic view and dismiss the test score um, emphasis. You know, it's it's funny because Avi just wrote, I just saw your note in the um, chat box too about like how will testing requirements align. And, you know, I think that what we're learning, I mean, many of you know or maybe don't know that they're we didn't do our state summative test scores this spring. Um, and who knows if we will do them this upcoming year. Um, but what it is focusing on is like, well, what do we actually wanna see in students? What is the graduate profile? What do we actually care about in terms of um, what we wanna see for students going out into the economy and the world? And I think it is being, putting us in a new space to really bring, dig harder and think deeper around demonstration of mastery and the actual like, skills and stuff that we want to see out of kids that they can demonstrate and maybe on their own path and pace and time and it doesn't have to necessarily be held to like a certain kind of system now that is lofty to do that quickly an emergency system like this across a system is hard but um i, I think there's a lot of people that are churning uh, back to your question like behind the scenes trying to see if this is a moment we can jump on to really rethink um what does uh, how do you how do you mix those worlds together? Um, sorry again. Like I said before, for the first question, I I said like students have the answers. They are the ones that know 
that what um, will happen in their classrooms. They are the ones are in the, they're in the classroom. And like obvious question was how would testing requirement change? I can give you a bunch of answers how it can change. But one, one of my big answers will be what we do with Hackett Initiative, the badging system. This badging system allows us to look at the kid holistically, which is what we're all finding. Because those test requirements are not, they're not an um, effective way to qualify a kid. And I don't think any test score is an effective way to qualify any true child. So with the badging system that we're having with ACAD and Edgeway, Rhode Island and um, Office of Innovation, I think that that's a very effective way that, that we can use to implement to our classrooms. Because without that, I, don't, I cannot see any other um, way that we can effectively qualify our students while helping them um, learn in class and use their engagement and passions. I agree that badging is now making a resurface in a way that could be something that all of you at Venture Cafe may be interested in looking into deeper um, as things progress. Uh, I do want to make sure I save a few minutes at the end right now for any questions. Um, I don't know if you usually just type them in the chat box or if you want to just spit them out um, for questions and comments for the panelists as we wrap. I just also want to say, uh, Deborah, I mean, Deborah and Dana, this idea of badging, I think, is is really important. And, you know, it also goes back to the idea that we have teachers and they're professionals. And I mean, obviously, we need to be paying them more. Um, and we should empower them to um, be able to think about new assessment criteria that says, okay, the student understands what we're getting out of this class and what we're getting achieved certain lessons rather than, um, you know, a 90, whatever that means. <laughs> so. A 90 means that 10% of the information you didn't have to learn. So, and if you can pass with a 60, that means by the time you're a senior, you just didn't have to learn 40% of educate, of school. You might as well have just gone half the time. So that's what it means, which is really insane. So. Great way to frame it. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I mean, I mean, my personal experience is I totally took advantage of that. I saw, okay, well, I can just get by with that, you know, um, and it took me a long time to realize that I could uh, so Deborah, Abby, I want to get back to you. You had a, you had a comment you wanted to share. Yeah, um, Abby said something like, "Oh, I could get by by that," and which is what like literally all our students are. I don't think that school should be somewhere you can get by just to leave and go back to college, which is why um, we can all incorporate everything like everyone was saying today. Um, the badging system, after school programs, um, Robert's design school, just. Um, incorporating all this like magnificent ideas to help our students with the badging system. We've been using that for a year long in um, PVD Young Makers and we can see that these kids have gotten life skills that they will never lose. Like what you learn, you, no one will ever take that from you and they can use those life skills in life after graduation um, schools, which I think should be the main focus of school. How will our kids survive the real life, not getting by uh, ESET exam or AP exam, because that's not going to help them in life. Uh, Deborah, I agree with you. I think there's too, I mean, not that taking an AP class isn't fabulous, but I think there's too much focus on taking an AP class and not enough focus, like you said. Like, I remember when I was 18, we had a guy come into our classroom and taught us how to, like, look for car insurance, how to look for renter's insurance, like, how to balance a checkbook. And I still remember that, and I'm almost 50. Like, but that was, like, really practical stuff that they taught us in the classroom. And, like, honest to God, my daughter is 18, and I'm not sure she knows that, so I should probably get on that. But that's stuff that I think is just as important to teach in the schools as math and English. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, assessments are a useful tool, but they're not the only determiner of success. And I think that we need to focus more on the whole child and, you know, than, than just on, did you, you know, are you on track to graduate? How many AP classes did you take and that sort of thing? So I, I agree with you completely. Unless there's other questions. I did, I did also want to check in with one more kind of clarification as someone who's not as tapped in with, with some of you talking right now in, in this current state of the education system. Um, and I think it's been highlighted a, a bunch of times here around digital equity. And we talked about how students are getting computers. There's some initiatives with that, but broadband access for many is still a, a huge hurdle. If, if there are, if some of the solutions in some of these districts are this kind of hybrid model where you can only go to school two days a week, three days a week, 
they were still leaving out some students. Are there provisions that are being considered to ensure that some students still have a safe place, an air conditioned space to either go to traditional schools or experience some, some after school programming? I've seen in some of the plans, some of the plans are making sure that you're getting almost everyone out so that the people that are in are the ones that really need to be in the building. But again, it's so um, up in the air of what will end up happening with any of that. But yes, I think, you know, and it's important, we didn't acknowledge during this conversation because there are just so many different sides this, you know, and so many different things to um, really be thinking about, but like the role of school beyond just the, well, you know, around nutrition, around health, mental health, trauma supports, like there's a lot of, you know, our schools have all turned into full service community school kind of modeling in some ways, you know, and so making sure that, um, how do we ensure that students are still getting that um, support if, you know, everyone needs, um, if they're not in a building physically together. So I think that that's been part of the, um, you know, I know that's a challenge that the governor and others are really trying to wrestle with as well when they make these hard decisions, so. Yeah, I want to add on to that and add that when we hear distance learning, we tend to think online learning. Um, and there's a ton of project based learning. And to go back to what Rob was saying, you know, like doing something hands on that doesn't necessitate that a child or a student sit in front of a computer for vast periods of time. Um, I know one of the science teachers, the biology teacher, go out and draw something from nature and then we'll talk about what it is that you drew, you know, when we're back online. So just because you're not in a physical classroom doesn't mean that there can't be parameters around what that learning activity is going to be. Um, and, you know, there's a ton of things that you can do that aren't necessarily online all the time. Um, and I think that it's important that we recognize that when we do speak of distance learning, we're not just talking about putting kids in front of a screen. So, Thank you so much. And again, that, that I, I think at the end of the day will be the, the transformation that we'll see in the long run, hopefully. Bobby, um, can we just, um, uh, anyone who, if you could look at David Dedekian's question in the comments, and I'm not sure who wants to reply to that, but obviously that's a huge concern of all of ours. Definitely, David Dedekian in the chat um, it points out the nutritional aspect that Dana also just highlighted, a uh, public health issue. Many students rely on uh, one, if not all of their meals from public school systems. I also know that there is an initiative, at least in Providence, that is bringing together small um, restaurants, food businesses who are creating, who are fundraising to make meals for students. Um, not sure how that's working out in other locations, especially other urban sectors, uh, maybe in Warren, Cranston, or Newport. Um, Avi, I know North Kingstown over the period, you know, when we had to shut down and went, to, they did a fabulous job. They rolled out, um, you know, their Feedables program, their Blessing in the Backpack program. They rolled it out and they made sure that every kid, you know, who, who needed a meal had one. Um, and they didn't even ask truly whether you needed it. It was just if you need food, show up. So, I mean, I, I have to believe that um, that's being factored into their, their plans. Um, they, they just, they did a fabulous job rolling that out with very little time to do it. Yeah. Um, I know that in Providence, we had like a lot of places where you could get food, and which was a wonderful idea. But I feel with the, some students that actually needed the food, the stigma of going to get it and the fear of going to get it was one of the most big problems. So most of the food just went into waste because those kids couldn't go get it or they feared to go get it that, oh my God, because some of them are immigrants. They're, oh, if you go get the food, you're getting like federal help or stuff like that. Or stigma like, oh, if you get the food, then you don't have food in your house and just hearing out all your secrets. So I feel like making the food more accessible to kids should be one of our top priorities because yes there is food but how can we get it to them do you have suggestions on that and i'm not not to put you on the spot but coming from your perspective do you because that stigma i'm sure is is something do you have any suggestions for that um i i what, what i heard you say is like um in not instant like they gave the food to everyone needed or not and i feel like that should be one of the one of the plans give rolling out a bus that goes to every kid's house to go like the school buses Kids are not going to be in the school buses now because we can't all put all 200 kids in one school bus. Those school bus can be used to go drive around and give every kid food, needed or not. If you don't need it, you can go donate it to someone. But please give everyone food because that's the problem with getting just sizing and just just 
dividing the kids into two, the kids that do need food, the kids that don't need food. The division is all that's always been in our classrooms. We need unity right now. Um, any last thoughts as we kind of wrap up this conversation? Really appreciate everyone's thought. Really educational for me. I'm sure many others. Um, and it leaves us with a lot to think about. Um, but also, I think there's a lot of positive action that's being taken and being considered. So this, this is really fantastic as we go into August and September.